You said that you started to make contact with the devotees in 76, so did you ever get a chance to actually meet Srila Prabhupada? No, no. I could have gone and tried to meet him in India, but at that time I was not uh, not ready to make that kind of a commitment. Mm, fair enough. You're talking about how you enjoy music, and you were saying like when you left your father you started playing on a guitar and started singing and I'm leaving, da 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 da. Has music been an important part of your life? And if so, have you had any professional training at all? As, uh -huh. far as music is concerned? Okay. Well, uh, I've been playing music uh, from very early age because my father was a musician. All right. Yeah. Uh, he had made the choice to go into business, you know, like, but during the Second World War, as a student, he was playing in bands and so on. So he was quite a good musician in many ways. But okay, he got more serious about business. So he taught <coughs> the kids to play musical instruments. Mm. So when we were kids, we were already playing. I was playing a mandolin and like that. Right. We were playing. Had a little home band with my sister. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have any contact with your family still? Uh, a little bit. Uh, I didn't have for a long time because my parents expired a long time ago. Okay. And then, you know, after that, uh, my family also was all over the world. My sister was married to, uh, to a Navy officer and every few years they transferred and moved to some corner of the world. But a few, so I, for, I, I lost track of her because there was always moving and I was always moving. But then a few years ago, somewhere, I saw her name in a phone book mm -hmm. uh, on the internet and then I noticed that she lived very close to Radedesh in Belgium. Really? So then, uh, less than yeah, 45 minutes away, so then I went there once I was in Radedesh, so I went for a visit one time. So nowadays I'm sometimes meeting my sister. My brother I haven't seen for a long time. He, he's not so interested in Krishna consciousness, so oh, it's a really big group. <coughs> Speaking of your early childhood and your family, uh, did you have spiritual aspirations when you were younger? Or were you brought up in a Christian or religious sort of family at all? Or? No. Um, I have somehow or other very little to do with Christianity. I never had affiliation with Christianity at That's all. That's amazing. Because Zero. Yeah. Uh, the only Christian influence I have in my life comes from the fact that other people in the country were Christian, but I went to the church only twice in my life. Really? Once to a, to a Catholic one and once to a yeah. Protestant one. Protestant. Yeah. That was it. Right. And, uh, <coughs> never went to the church, didn't feel at home also in the church. I thought it was uh, too, too dark for me. But did you have spiritual feelings yourself when you were younger? Did you uh, contemplate God or... What the truth. Yeah. The truth. I was interested in the truth. Uh, see, my parents were very liberal. Uh, they were open and they didn't want to impose anything on their children. For example, we could, uh, when other children or other young people, their parents would always tell them what time to come home. You know? But my parents never told me what time to come home. I could come home any time I liked. But all, but of course, they knew all my friends had to come home at 10 o'clock, so I also came home at 10 o'clock. <laughs> but with religion, you know, when I was about six, I remember that my father told me, he said, we don't want to impose any religion upon you, and therefore we leave the choice up to you. At six years old. Yeah, and I thought like, but how am I going to figure it out? <laughs> so in this way, religion was something I thought, well, put it on the shelf, you know, I'll deal yeah. with it later. Yeah, fair enough. So then you, you became a devotee, you became uh, an important devotee very quickly in that you took on responsibilities and uh, one of those responsibilities was that you were a temple president of Vrindavan, uh, Krishna Balaram Mandir in Vrindavan. I just want to go back to this, this moment in your life because it's so exceptional in that it doesn't happen to the everyday run-of-the-mill devotee where there's a, a murder or a threat of, of an attack upon you. Uh, how did you cope with that? 
And what are the ramifications of that attack to this day? Mm. Do you still feel threatened or do you feel, you know, uh, some feeling towards that at all? Anyway, um, first of all, when I became president in Vindavan, there was a difficult situation. Vindavan is, is a place which is uh, the spiritual world, it's transcendental. But then, uh, on top of that transcendental place, there is another place, the world uh, of Yoga Maya, an illusory Indian village that is like a covering that hides the spiritual Vrindavan. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, in this day and age, Vrindavan, on the, on the level of the covering, is in Uttar Pradesh, which is a bit of a lawless state in India and in the district. Life is like that. There's not much law and order. Mm. Yeah. So it's always been like that. And uh, so there is a bit of a mafia in Vrindavan. Uh, ordinary people don't deal with such, uh, such people, but when you're a president of a big institution, you may get some interaction. And I was buying some land for the temple, right. and in the process, I, I once stepped on the toes of, uh, of some mafia people, because they had come to me and wanted some, uh, uh, they wanted to sell some land, and uh, I, uh, I bought it directly from the owner and not from them, and saved sixty thousand dollars. Right. Not Australian dollars, by the American. way. American. So there's a lot of money. Yeah. So uh, possibly that could have been one, one motive, why, why something happened. To you. There could be other reasons, maybe a disgruntled devotee. There's always a disgruntled devotee in a big temple. Anyway, one night I went to the bathroom and suddenly as I was in the bathroom, bang, from above, over the wall, and then I got hit by a bullet. And uh, yeah, I felt that in slow motion go through me. And uh, I fell on the ground and Instinctively, I realized not to go unconscious, mm. so I stayed. I knew if I go unconscious here, I'll bleed to death and they'll find me tomorrow. Right. Yeah. So I managed to do some pranayama and I dealt with the pains and I stayed conscious. Uh, then I pulled myself up on the door handle and I saw that here on the right side, there was like a ball hanging like, like as big as a football. Mm. And, well. In there, there was blood and bits of flesh and so on, bits of stomach and bits of liver and bits of that. And so, didn't look good. And I thought to myself, I may not survive this. But I thought, somehow or other, I should get out of this bathroom so that people can find me. Yeah. Yeah, so, I did that. And I... I but it was very painful, so I fell on my knees on the veranda in great pain. And the first person who came was South American. And when he asked me what happened, I whispered and I said, shot. Uh, and he heard, shock, shock? You got an electric shock? And I couldn't, I could hardly speak. Mm. And then he told everyone that I had an electric shock. <laughs> and, I, and I was sitting there and I couldn't speak. So I couldn't tell anybody, I got sh no, I got shot and I'm bleeding to death. Take me to a hospital, but I couldn't speak, so I, I couldn't say. So I was just sitting there and thinking, all these people around me looking like at me and they were looking what to do. And I was the one who usually told everyone what to do. And now there was no one to tell them what to do. And they're totally confused. And nobody was, was making arrangements for me to go to a hospital or anything. I was just sitting there. And I thought, I may really die. Right? I'd better start thinking about Krishna. So I was uh, thinking about Krishna and I prayed to Krishna as good as I could. I was very <coughs> dizzy. So it was difficult to chant the full Maha Mantra. I was so dizzy uh, that I just said, Krishna. Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. And then I prayed to Krishna. I said, okay, maybe I can take birth in the Gurukul. You know? I said, I'll take the risk. 
uh, sometimes, and uh, and come back in Vrindavan. Well, uh, okay, you know the immediate experience. There are some more details, but mm -hmm. they're not for here and now. Do you, do you still have? Repercussion, physical repercussions from those oh, injuries? Oh, well, you know. Uh, if you take a, take a shoe and you shoot a bullet through it, it's not going to be a new shoe, you know. So if you shoot a hole through the, yeah. through the body, from the back to the front, uh, you're going to have some problems. But that's all right. I think that, uh, you know, I was in the hospital and I really, and the police came. And uh, the big, the DIG, you know, that's a big policeman in India, personally came. A uh, big district head, you know, like uh, of the Aga district, two million people, he comes. And he says, well, we've investigated the case. He said, you know, we really have no evidence, there's nothing we can do. He said, but I can give you this. And he pulls out his gun and puts it on my bed. And he said, I can give you this, uh, which means... You take care of it, <laughs> local style. So I said, no, that's okay, you, that's it. you keep that one. He said, yeah, it looks better for a sadhu maybe not to get into it. <laughs> I said, thank you so much. Uh, so, you know, I had to, had to really think in that hospital and I had to think like, uh, well, I was thinking of Dharma, the bull Dharma. Yeah. When the bull Dharma, when Dharma's legs were broken by Kali, Kali was standing there next to the bull with a stick in his hands, and Maharaj Pariksit arrives on the spot and says, Who did this? And the bull says, It's hard to say. <laughs> it's hard to say. What is the, it could be karma, it could be the will of providence. So I also was thinking, Yeah, I can look at the cause, and the ultimate cause is Krishna. Right. Somehow or other Krishna sent me this. I'm trying to be a devotee and Krishna sent me this uh, for my purification, for my growth and I will have to take it like that. Mm -hmm. I'll have to take this as Krishna's mercy and that I have to learn from this. So that is really the more interesting part of mm -hmm. the whole story. Like what was there uh, to learn? In, in, in this shot and um, in one shot you know, sometimes I thought I should write a little book in that book I will not write so much about how the conspiracy came about or who did it or who didn't do it who were the suspects and mm -hmm. there were several but I will write more about the internal meaning you know what That's lesson really did I learn from it right? it would be called in one shot because in one shot, I don't know if I'll ever write it, but in, because I'm not such a writer, but in one shot, many lessons were there. Mm. First of all, I had, uh, I had, I was on, uh, on the waiting list for sannyas, I was preparing for sannyas when yeah. this thing happened. And you know, in the Vedic literature, it says sannyas means you're socially dead. Well, that's exactly what happened to me. Because, you know, in India, uh, when you get, uh, when something happens to a person, then the police comes and they do a, a jimba, they do a, a sealing of the, of the room. Yeah. They seal everything and no one's allowed in. And meanwhile, they go in there and steal everything they can from that room. Because mm -hmm. yeah? they're the only ones allowed in. And then by the time, you know, Three months later, they open it up and the room is empty, right? Everybody knows this, right? I also knew this, and the devotees also knew this. And there were two places, one my room, and the other one was the office downstairs, and they were all valuable things, and, and there were safes in both places, you know, since I was the president of a large institution. So the devotees were very worried. So what they did is they emptied out everything from, the, from my room and from the office, and then it went all over the place. And then everything disappeared. So I went to the bathroom and I never came back in my old identity. And everything I had disappeared. And it was virtually like my identity died. 